welcome again to the second part of the finding moment of inertia of a flywheel. In the previous part, we discussed a flywheel rotating in friction-free bearings. Now, that is not the case in reality. It is only the case when we are assuming that we've got bearings that are friction-free, which in reality is never possible, but it is usually done for the purposes of setting up a question in exam. So, how are we going to work this out when we do have friction within the bearings and they will be slowing our system down? We'll have to go again um, and apply this same equation, whereby, just a quick reminder, this is the potential energy stored in this mass, this will be powering our whole system. Half i omega squared represents the rotational Ke, meaning some of this energy causes the flywheel to spin, so some of this energy is being transferred to the flywheel for it to rotate. Then you have got what is known as translational Ke, and translational Ke is the kinetic energy of this mass for it to move downwards. Now, if there's going to be friction within the bearings in the mounting, then some of this potential energy is going to be used as work to overcome such friction in the bearings. So we do need to add one more parameter in that equation. We do this by adding work done due to friction, and for reasons you'll understand later on, this work done should be calculated per revolution. Okay, so this is the amount of work done per revolution, meaning if this string is wrapped, say, 10 times around the axle, meaning whilst this is falling downwards, it's going to spin the axle, it's going to accelerate the axle through 10 turns, that means that this work done per revolution must be multiplied to that amount of turns which I am denoting by capital N. So, if, it's go if there's going to be one joule per revolution lost, of energy lost within the bearings due to friction, then we're going to multiply that by the number of turns that the flywheel turned to get the full work done or to overcome friction. So as discussed in the previous video, we know all our parameters other than the moment of inertia. However, this time round, we also do not know the work done due to friction. So this is also another unknown. As far as the turns are concerned, we can easily know that by counting how, ma how many times the string is wrapped around the main axle. So this should be very easy to find out. However, we ended up with two unknowns. And as you know from previous work in physics and in mathematics, if you've got two unknowns, you do need two, two equations. And this is what is going to make this a bit more difficult or a bit, a, a bit of a longer calculation. How are we going to go about this? We need to solve this problem with the work. Do you really need to find the work done due to friction? No, not necessarily. From the second equation, we can up, come up with parameters with which we can um, uh, substitute the work done from our system and get totally different parameters with the only unknown being the moment of inertia. So how are we going to go about this? In the previous video, we said we're going to have a value for time. And if you remember, time is going to be measured by a stopwatch. Once this mass is let go, and the mass hits the ground, that's going to give us the full amount of time for the mass to fall downwards. We, we know that we're going to start with zero meters per second as far as the velocity is concerned. We do not know, however, the final velocity, but we said we can calculate that. See the, vi the previous video to know how to calculate that. The acceleration, we also said we need to calculate that in order to find the velocity and the total distance that this mass will move through is going to be equal to the height, which would be um, easily measured uh, by a meter rule or tape measure. So we do need one more reading to, for us to work with such an equation. Um, we need to count the number of turns, 
okay? Now, the number of turns up until this hits the ground, that's easy, because if we do know how many times the string is wrapped around the axle, that's going to be easy. However, what we suggest you do is to mark the flywheel, and whilst it's going round, you just count the number of revolutions. Now, it might get a bit fast, okay? So you might need to repeat this experiment several times uh, to be sure that your readings are correct. However, what's going to happen is, once this mass hits the ground, the flywheel will keep on spinning under its own energy. Now, this is the main concept that you need to understand. Generally, you're going to count the full number of revolutions until the flywheel comes to a stop. What does that mean? Whilst this is falling downwards, whilst it is exerting a torque on the axle, it's fairly obvious from where the flywheel is getting its energy. But please do realize that once this hits the ground and the looped end detaches from that pin, the flywheel is rotating under its own energy, which is equal to this. This is the amount of energy that the flywheel possesses at that instance. If the flywheel is going to eventually stop, which it will, that means that all of this energy has been used as work to overcome friction in the bearings. It is only the friction within the bearings that's going to stop the flywheel. So we can come up with a second equation. Remember, we've got two unknowns, so we do need two equations. We can come up with a second equation, which states that all the rotational Ke in the flywheel is going to be used to do work done due to friction per revolution times the number of turns that it's going to do once the mass detaches. So this N is different from that. So what we might do is, this is, we might label it as N1, which would be the number of turns that the flywheel rotates under the effect of the torque. Once this mass detaches, hits the ground and the string detaches from, from the axle, then you're going to keep on counting and the second number of turns, or rather the number of turns um, that will happen once the string is detached, or from when the string detaches up until the flywheel comes to a dead stop, then I'm going to label that as N2. This is therefore half I omega squared, and this is equal to F rev N2. If you've counted the number of turns, then we do know this value, and we also know that value. As far as unknowns are concerned, it is still i, which is unknown. Omega, we said we're going to calculate from here. I mean, this is the same value. This is the maximum angular velocity that the flywheel reached. We're going to get that from the linear velocity. We said by using v equals r omega. And that leaves us with just these two unknowns again. But we do not need this unknown in our equation. So what we do is we place the work done as subject of this equation and substitute all that within the first equation. Remember that the work done per revolution at the end, when the flywheel is spinning under its own energy and not the mass ex exerting the torque on it, that is going to be the same amount of work done to overcome friction as within the first part of the experiment. Remember, we're keeping the same bearings here. So same friction and therefore same amount of energy per revolution. So what we'll do is we rearrange this equation and that is going to be work done due to friction per revolution is equal to the rotational Ke divided by the number of turns that the flywheel does under its own energy, okay? So meaning from when the mass detaches up until it comes to a dead stop. And what we'll do is we'll take this equation and we'll substitute all of that into the first equation. So what we'll end up with is such an equation. I've substituted 
uh, using the second equation, the work done due to friction. So as you can see, you don't really need to calculate the work done due to friction. You can eventually if you're interested in that, but the aim of this experiment generally, or of these questions generally, is to find the moment of inertia of the flyweight. And as you can see, within this equation, you've, we've translated the work done due to friction in terms of the moment of inertia, leaving us with just the moment of, in of inertia as our unknown. And by this equation, we could easily solve for the moment of inertia of such a flyway.